قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا عنك وزرك الذي أنقض ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls and the enlightenment of the hearts and for the hastening of the reappearance of بقية الله الأعظم روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of صلوات upon محمد وآل محمد Respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He was considered in 1935 as one of the best lawgivers in the history of mankind. He is respected, revered, followed like no other human being. According to the Office of National Statistics in the United Kingdom, his name chopped, topped the chart when it comes to the newborns given in 2011 in London, Oslo, and many European countries. His name is translated as the praiseworthy. He is, of course, none other than Ar Rasul al A'zam Muhammad. An examination of the Holy Quran and traditions from the Ahl al-Bayt salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim ajma'een reveal this important fact that the position enjoyed by the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him, and the Holy Progeny is like no other. In other words, the Quran is full of praise to the maqam of the Holy Prophet. The ahadith point to his excellence, to his attributes, to his achievements, to his noteworthy establishments and his everlasting legacy. You only need to look at ayat such as Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa innaka la'ala khulqin azim. You have the best exalted characteristics and attributes. Likewise, in the world of hadith, you and I will come across many which point to the importance of understanding whom the Holy Prophet of Islam indeed is. One hadith narrated from Abu Dar al-Ghufari, Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi states that two angels of Allah, Mikail and Jibra'il, were disputing with each other, were discussing with each other whom was better in the eyes of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mikail said to Jibra'il, I am better. Why? Because the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me many responsibilities. Jibra'il said, I am better. Why? Because I am the one who delivers the message and revelation to his prophets. Before the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, they came forward. They said, oh my Lord, which one of us is better in your eyes? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and said, wa izzati wa jalali, inni khalaqtu unas. By my might and glory, I have created people better than you. Thereafter, he revealed the side of the arsh, the throne of Allah, which stated that what? La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun wa Aliyun wa Fatima wa al-Hasan wa al-Hussein afdalu khalqillah. That these five individuals were the best of God's creation, an individual who is a non-believer comes to the Holy Prophet and asks him a number of questions. When Rasulullah answers these questions in the best of ways, he says to him that in my scripture, in my book, I have that you will answer my question. And every time that I wish to delete your name from my scripture, your name returns back. And I am there to understand that when you answer my question, next to you are Mikail, and next to you is Jibra'il, and sitting next to me is, vice is your vicegerent. 
the Prophet looks at him and says, indeed, here is Jibra'il and here is Mikail and next to me is Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. An examination therefore reveals the status of the Holy Prophet. You and I may be wondering, why begin the discussion in this commemoration with the remembrance of Rasulullah? You and I understand also, being Muslims living in the West, that recently the status and the name of the Holy Prophet of Islam has been subject to a barrage of attacks and abuse and insult. When we come to commemorate the ultimate form of sacrifice and the devotion displayed by his grandson, Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, what better way than to initiate this majalis with the remembrance of the Holy Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sallam Why? Because the Holy Imam Sayyid al-Shuhada stood to reform the Ummah of the Holy Prophet and as we find in Sunan al-Tirmadhi we find Rasulullah saying Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn Ahabb Allah man ahabb Husayna Husaynun sibtun min al-asbaat that this hadith is shared by all Muslims. The Prophet of Islam says, Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Whomsoever loves Hussein, Allah will surely love them. In other words, the whole ethos and the philosophy of the movement of Aba Abdullah al Hussein was that to indeed revive the name of the Holy Prophet and ensure that you and I here living in the West, in this country and many others, are able to practice and uphold the values and the principles of the religion of Islam. Therefore, how beautiful it is that every year when we commence, when we initiate, when we begin the remembrance of the tragedy of Ashura and the sacrifice and the revolution of Aba Abdullah, we begin by understanding and reminding ourselves about the maqam and the position of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And what better way to do so than to look at the Holy Quran. If you and I look at the Holy Quran, specifically chapter 93 and 94, Surah Al-Duha wa Surah Al-Inshirah. When you look at these chapters, and of course the Quran has many references in exalting the name of the Holy Prophet, but I wish to examine these two chapters for a number of reasons. Number one, it has a number of jurisprudential as well as theological implications for you and I. Number two, there, is, there are a number of misconceptions that have been used by the enemies of Islam from certain narrations that exist when it comes to the tafsir of these chapters. Number three, it has relevance when it comes to the commemoration and the establishment of the majalis of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Let's look at these two chapters. First of all, Surah Al-Duha wa Surah Al-Inshirah, when it comes to our prayers, when it comes to our salah, need to be recited together. What does that mean? Our fuqaha, our ulama say, there are a total of four surahs, four chapters of the Holy Quran, that two by two need to be recited together in salah. The school of Ahl al-Bayt states, that after Surah Al-Fatiha, in obligatory prayers, one must recite a complete chapter. However, there are two instances whereby two separate chapters, if one of them is recited, the other one must be recited straight away. Which one are they? The first is Surah Al-Inshirah, followed, uh, followed by Surah Al-Duha or vice versa. And the second is Surah Al-Feel and Surah Li'ilafi Quraysh. So for example, I'm reciting Salatul Maghrib. And after, salah, after reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, I begin by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal-Duha, wal-Layli idha saja. When I complete the chapter, our fuqaha say, I must not go into ruku'. I must do what? I must thereafter say what? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alam nashrah laka sadrak. That the recitation of Surah Al-Inshirah after Surah Al-Duha is obligatory in Salah. Why? Why is that so? 
The reason being is that our ulama are of the opinion that these two chapters are actually one, separated by the basmala. <coughs> separated by Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When you examine these two chapters, you find a number of similarities. The message from Surah Al-Duha continues into Surah Al-Inshirah. Allah says in Surah Al-Duha, أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَى In Surah Al-Inshirah, what does he say? أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ Because the idea emerges, and that's what? And that is, when you and I are in Salah, and these are important fiqh rulings, when you are, I are in Salah, which is wajib, and we have just recited Surah Al-Fatiha, we have to have in our minds what we will recite as far as the next chapter is concerned. So if I decided to recite Surah Al, for instance, Tawheed, Al-Ikhlas, I say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, then I change my mind. I want to recite Surah Inna and Zannahu. I need to recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim again. Why? Because the school of Ahl al-Bayt believes that the basmala is part of every chapter, every surah of the Qur'an. So if I was to say that in my mind I wanted to recite Surah Al-Tawheed or Surah Al-Nas, and then I change my mind before the initiation, I need to start once again with the basmala. This is an important consideration when we reflect once more in the Chapter 93 and 94 of the Holy Quran. When you come to the chapter itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. The word nashrah comes from inshirah, which means what? Lexically in Arabic, it means to dissect, to carve open. When you come to the tafasir, what do you find? When you look at the tafasir of our brothers from other schools of thought, not from the school of Ahl al-Bayt, you'll find that they'll say the following, that this particular ayah of the Holy Quran was revealed for what? Was revealed due to an incident in the life of our Holy Prophet, al Rasul al-A'zam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Which is known as what? In Sharh al-Sadr, this incident is a matter of controversy, is a matter of dispute amongst many people and scholars outside the school of Ahl al-Bayt. But thankfully, the ulama of the Imamiyya are unanimous in rejecting the following story. The story is known as the story of the Prophet's chest, and the story needs to be understood. Why? Because today, unfortunately, some people are utilizing this in attacking the religion of Islam and ridiculing our teachings and the Holy Quran. What is the story of the Prophet's chest? Please pay attention so that you appreciate the school of Ahl al-Bayt and the pristine teachings that we have directly from the family of the Holy Prophet. The story is found in Imam al-Muslim's compilation, Sahih al-Muslim, in eight places. Eight places you'll find the story. For instance, in volume one. What does this story say? This story says that the Prophet was four years of age. He was being looked after by his wet nurse, Halima Sa'diya. One day he was playing with the children, and Jibra'il came down from the heavens. Apologies to the young children here in this blessed audience for going into detail. But unfortunately, this is what the hadith states. That Jibra'il grabbed Rasulullah, placed him on the ground, immediately opened up his chest, took out his heart, and says, Hadha hadhu shaytan. I can see a knot inside your heart. He takes the heart, he washes it in zamzam water, and then he places the heart of Rasulullah back in his chest. At that moment, he closes the chest, ends the surgical operation. That Jibra'il somehow is now a physician, a doctor that operates on the Holy Prophet. He, he immediately ends this particular process. Those children around the Prophet are astonished. They say, 
We have never seen such a thing happen. They look at the Holy Prophet and he's pale. They run towards Halima Sa'diya and they said, Qutila Muhammad. At that moment, Halima rushes towards Rasulullah. She finds him in the state. She takes him and returns him back to his mother, Amina. This is the gist of the story. Yet, unfortunately, it gets worse. What does the story state? The story state that it happened five times in the life of the Holy Prophet. Five times. When? When he was four, when he was ten, when he was forty, when he went on the Isra and the Mi'raj. And the fifth one is when? I don't know. Not that I don't know. The narrator says, I don't know. Five times the Prophet's heart is taken out from his blessed body, washed and returned. And that's the belief of many Muslims around the world today. Question, what is our viewpoint in a very academic, scientific, rational discussion with no emotion? What is our stance when it comes to this story? How do we look at it? What is our opinion behind it? Doesn't the Quran say, Alam nashrah laka sadrak? Did we not carve open and dissect your chest? Therefore, this is what is presented as the interpretation of this ayah. As we mentioned, the school of Ahl al Bayt, our Mufassireen, they reject this. They say we reject this due to a number of considerations. Please pay attention to why we reject it. Number one, since when was evil and bad doings and the actions of shaitan associated with a knot in the heart, in the physical heart? If it was, then today the, those physicians and doctors will be the richest in the world when it comes to the Muslim world. Because all of us will go to them and say, excuse me, I think I have a problem. I'm sinning a lot. Can you take my heart out and wash it? This is what we do. Since when was evil associated with our hearts? Our physical hearts, number one. Number two, why would the Prophet of Islam need to go through this very strenuous, difficult process of his chest being opened up and his heart being washed? Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wanted to do so, he could have done so very easily. Why would Jibra'il need to go through this process? Number three, why is it that we do not find any other prophets in history having to go through this? Only the Prophet of Islam. What? does this say about our prophet in comparison to the other prophets number four why is it that we do not find a single tradition that states that the shaitan went and opened the chest of rasulullah how is it that the shaitan was able to put a knot whereas jibrail couldn't take a knot out except by opening the chest of the holy prophet and number five does this not contradict the holy quran which clearly states that the shaitan cannot even cl get close to the prophets, including the best upon them, the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. قَالَ فَبِعَزَّتِكَ لَأَغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ The Quran says that the shaitan says, I will get to them all, except those purified individuals that you have selected, I cannot get close to. In other words, the Quran emphatically states that the shaitan cannot get close to the prophets of God, awliya Allah, the ma'asumeen. How is it that he can place a knot in the heart of the prophet? Therefore, this story is fabricated and we reject it categorically. It has no place in Islamic theology and indeed, it's a direct attack. We consider it on the maqam and the position of the holy prophet with full respect to those who narrate it. What do we say? We say that the school of Ahl al-Bayt honors and reveres Rasulullah, my dear brothers and sisters, like no other school in the religion of Islam, and mark my words. What do we mean? You look at other schools of thought and they question the asma of the Holy Prophet. The school of Ahl al-Bayt says Rasulullah was born ma'soom, chosen by Allah to be the best of his creation, the best role model, the exemplary individual that you and I look up to, to seek inspiration and motivation in our lives. We look at him like no other human being. In other words, Rasulullah enjoys this status. That's number one. Number two, you ask the question, where did this idea come from then? I did a bit of research on this and I found there is a hadith or there is a historical tradition in the time of Jahiliyyah. There was a man by the name of Ubay 
Ibn Abi Salt. He, one day, he says that I was sitting in my house and all of a sudden I saw two birds. These two birds charged on my chest. They sat on my chest. They started digging on my chest. I couldn't push them away. They opened up my chest. They looked at my heart. They looked at each other. It is as if they were asking each other questions. At that moment, they closed my heart and they went away. This particular tradition or historical reference is found at the time of Jahiliyyah. And therefore, this fabrication, unfortunately, has found its way in the books of Muslims. The Quran states, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. You might ask, what does this mean then? What does it mean, Alam nashrah laka sadrak? Here in Shirah comes to our mind when it comes to the opening and the expanding of one's capacity for two reasons. Number one, to be able to withstand the difficulties, the calamities, the trials, and the hardship in life. Who amongst us does not go through hardship? Who amongst us does not go through the systematic, sometimes difficulties and bala that you and I are subjected to? Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Holy Prophet, we have expanded your capacity. We have expanded your ability to withstand what? All that's thrown against you. What kind of things that the Holy Prophet had to withstand? One person says that one day I saw Rasulullah standing on the Mount of Safa. And I wondered, why is the Prophet wearing red today? I looked at him. I said, he's wearing red today. I came close to him and I realized that he wasn't wearing red clothes. He was drenched with his blood due to the fact that he was pelted with stones and attacked in such a manner by his enemies. People used to come and call him a sorcerer, a magician, a sahir, a kahin, a majnoon. Allah says, I have expanded your chest. In other words, your ability to withstand what these individuals will do to you, how they will treat you, how they will treat your family. Number one. Number two, there is an important notion that you and I need to understand. And that is what? That Allah wa ta'ala sometimes expands our capacity in taking and understanding the knowledge that is presented before you and I. That when it comes to seeking and being illuminated by the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our chest needs to expand. And the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has expanded the chest of the Holy Prophet the greatest so that he can receive the revelation, so that he can receive the commands of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our understanding of Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak. The Quran then continues and says what? وَوَضَعْنَا عَنْكَ وِزْرَكَ الَّذِي أَنْقَضَ ظَهْرَكَ We have removed from you the burden. What is this burden? Some of the Mufassirin, once again, they say the burden are sins. We say, no, these are not the sins. The school of Ahl al-Bayt says that the Prophet and his Ahl al-Bayt are sinless. They're error-free. They've been chosen by Allah. What is this wizard then? It is the responsibility that was on the shoulders of Rasulullah. It was the sheer pressure on his shoulders to ensure that the message reaches far and wide. It reaches you and I. He was concerned that this message would indeed be received by people so that they follow the right path. الَّذِي أَنْقَضَ ظَهْرَكْ وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ This very important ayah, my dear brothers and sisters, which stands today to denounce any efforts to tarnish and to attack the personality of Rasulullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala categorically states in the Holy Quran that despite the attempts and the ways of anyone around the world today who seeks to somehow distort the message and the personality and the teaching of Rasulullah, this will never happen and his remembrance will forever rise and his name shall forever be called and loved by people around the world. Tell me, is there a human being whose name is mentioned by more than one billion human beings more than nine times a day? 
Is there a human being out there? One billion human beings mention the name Muhammad in salah, in salawat, on a daily basis. And that is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ That your name, your mentioning will be exalted. Despite the attempts of people, they may produce movies, they may attempt to ridicule, they may draw cartoons, they may attack the personality of Rasulullah. But the message is very clear. The more they attack the Prophet of Islam, the more people are drawn towards him and the more the Muslims love him and follow him. And that is an important message sent to all those who think that by doing all this, they're somehow reducing the affinity and the relationship of the people with the greatest human being, the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Question though, when the Quran says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ What does it mean to you and I? What are the practical connotations and the applications of this رَفْعُ الذِّكْرَ of the Holy Prophet? And when we say, that the Quran says that the name of the Holy Prophet shall be exalted. This is not restrict, re restricted to the Prophet only. Why? Because the Quran says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. The Quran commands you and I to salute and to send blessings towards the Holy Prophet and whom and his Ahl al-Bayt. You ask me how? I say to you all Muslims from all denominations, they have come forward and stated that the prayer, that this salah that you and I recite upon the Prophet is incomplete without mentioning his family, without mentioning his pure sinless Ahl al-Bayt. As we find in the narration found in Imam al-Bukhari's compilation that the Sahaba came to the Holy Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, we know how to salute you by saying the salam upon you. But we don't know how to send salawat upon you. The Prophet says, say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In other words, the all are included in this particular salutation. And if you count the number of words... In this ayat of salawat, what do you find? The number of words in ayat of salawat is how many? 14. Ayat of salawat has 14 words. This is not a coincidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending you and I an important message. A message that the Ahl al-Bayt have mentioned. That the Ahl al-Bayt say, Awwaluna Muhammad, Awsatuna Muhammad. آخرنا محمد وكلنا محمد. What does it mean to you and I when the Quran says ورفعنا لك ذكرك that your mentioning has been exalted not only yours but the أهل البيت صلوات الله وسلامه عليهم أجمعين. It means that you and I whether we like it or not are ambassadors of the Holy Prophet and the أهل البيت. We wear this badge with honor and pride that the name of Rasulullah and the Ahl al-Bayt is being exalted and spread and introduced and recognized by people around the world through you and I as Muslims, through you and I as the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. In which way? Through our characteristics, through our moral conduct, through our behavior, through how we represent ourselves in society. If you and I appreciate that we are the tools by which people understand whom the Holy Prophet of Islam is and are inspired by the name Muhammad, then this makes us think twice as to how we present ourselves in society. The next time I'm out there and I am conducting myself in the way that I wish to with my colleagues, at college, at school, or at the workplace. Where am I and where is this responsibility of the ambassadorship of representation of the religion of Islam and the personality of Rasulullah? In other words, when I conduct myself, when I'm driving on the streets and someone annoys me, or 
I am there and I'm tempted to break the law of the land. Because we have a problem in certain societies that some Muslims have this false notion that I can do whatever I want just because they're non-believers. That I'm a Muslim and somehow I've decided I'm superior. I can break the law of the land. Who says so? Our maraja, our ulama say that the law of the land has to be respected. Except on the rare instances that it contradicts Sharia law. Which we do not find in the majority of cases in the West. When you and I are conducting our affairs with non-Muslims, when you and I are speaking with people, when we and I, you and I are conducting whatever we are, we should carry this message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly sent to us for if, to reflect upon, and that is we represent Rasulullah. We represent the Ahl al-Bayt, and we have a responsibility. It's not just me personally. It's not what I do out there. It's what I do that counts and people will judge my religion, my prophet, my, my imams. And therefore, when I wear my hijab, when it comes to the sisters, and when I present myself in transactions for all brothers and sisters, I need to be very careful of that and that recognition in order for me not to, in any shape or form, disregard this responsibility on my shoulders. Yet another manifestation of this raf'u dhikr is the reviving of the affairs of the Holy Prophet and his Ahl al-Bayt. Ensuring that we understand their lives, we recall their tragedies, and we uphold a majalis in their name. And one of the greatest demonstration of this ayah of raf'u dhikr wa rafa'na laka dhikrak is the majalis of Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al-Husayn salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. If you look around the world, my dear brothers and sisters, every Muharram, the majalis of Aba Abdullah increase by number. The people who walk to Karbala in the different times of the year, but especially in Arba'een, increase in number. And nobody is being forced. Nobody's putting a knife on their necks and saying, come to the majalis. And you come and people attend and they listen and they weep and they cry and they lament year after year after year. And the message of Hussein continues to grow and to flourish and to indeed be heard by more and more people. This is the powerful impact of the message and the majalis of Aba Abdullah. And that's why the Ahl al-Bayt emphasized the importance of holding these majalis. I recall that one of the scholars, one of our maraji, Rudwanullah ta'ala alayhi, he used to say, he used to say that the majalis of Aba Abdullah al Hussein are an extension of the haram of Sayyid al-Shuhada. That you and I, when we sit in these majalis, and when we recall the tragedy and the masaib of Ashura, and when we take something, and when we implement that positive change, and that change from within, indeed this is an extension from the haram of Aba Abdullah. And at the same time, we are counted as the zuwar of Hussein ibn Ali. Why? Because of this instrumental process and this potential that these majalis have. Ahyu amrana rahimallahu man ahya amrana. Question that some people pose is why should we gather? Why should we sit there? Why should we recall? Why should we uphold these majalis? What are the reasons? Where is the indication in the Holy Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many instances the Holy Quran commands you and I to show love, respect and loyalty towards the family of the Holy Prophet. When it comes to what? When it comes to Surah Al-Dhuha that we just spoke about. The Quran says, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Question. What is this ni'mah of Allah, this favor, this blessing of the Almighty that the Quran is instructing you and I to inform and to speak to other people about? Imam al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, 
so once asks somebody, what is the meaning? فحدث, he says, the response from one of his companions was that there are many favors, there are many blessings of the Almighty. The fact that I can live, the fact that I have wealth and I have health are all blessings. Imam Salamullah says, yes, but here Allah talks about one ni'mah. One blessing. What is that ni'mah? That man says, Allah wa rasuluhu wa awladuhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger and his family know better. Imam al-Sadiq responds and says, the answer is in the Quran. Look at how the imma alayhum salam extract these answers from the Quran. What does he say? He says, look at ayat al-Ghadir. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Yawm akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati Today I have completed my religion. And indeed what? Fulfilled the favor upon you. This ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about is the ni'mah of wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Indeed, this is a ni'mah, a blessing that you and I should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Yet the Almighty says, not only should you be grateful, but you should speak to people about. Invite them to the call and to the teachings and the wonderful ways of the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as salam Wa amma bin'amati rabbika fahaddith. Question. These majalis of Aba Abdullah al Hussein that you and I are striving to establish and to attend, like everything else has etiquettes, have adab, have considerations that the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as salam have informed us. They themselves were the ones who first established the majalis of Hussein. Like whom? Like when the Imam, Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam looks at a companion by the name of Ibn al-Shabib and says to him, Ya Ibn al-Shabib, do you know which day this is? A day like tomorrow, the first of Muharram. He says to him, this is the month by which the Jahiliya, the people at the time of ignorance used to respect its sanctity. Used to ensure that no blood is shed. They would not initiate a war during this month. Yet the Ummah of the Holy Prophet violated it they shed the blood of the family of rasulullah they killed his family they enslaved his women and indeed the hadith is emphatic and very important but it highlights the establishment of the majalis that the imam would say to him Yabna shabib and kunta baqiyan ala ahad if you were to cry over anyone, فَبْكِ عَلَى الْحُسَيْنَ بْنَ عَلِي فَإِنَّهُ ذُبِحَكَ الْحَكَبْشِ Cry over Hussein ibn Ali because he was slaughtered just like a sheep would, would be slaughtered. Indeed, these majalis have etiquettes, have adab. Let's look at the ad etiquettes and the adab of the majalis of Hussein, of Aba Abdullah. Number one, our scholars say that from the organizers of the majalis, to the reciter, to those who attend, the intention has to be crystal clear for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, ikhlas should be there. Sincerity should, have, should be established that these majalis are for the sake of the Almighty. Why? The shaitan gets busy and stronger during these majalis utilizes an opportunity therefore as individuals as believers we have to understand and plead to allah to do what to strengthen our hearts so that every single action and every thought of ours is purely for his sake to Allah belongs this pure, unadulterated, pristine religion. The religion of Islam is based and founded upon sincerity and ikhlas, my dear brothers and sisters. Something that the Ahl al-Bayt established brilliantly and the ulama learned from them. Many of you have heard the story of Shaykh Abbas al-Qummi, radhwanullahi ta'ala alayh, the author of Mafatih al-Jinan. Yet, He's also the author of a book by the name of Manazul al-Akhirah, The Stations of Akhirah. Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi himself states, 
He says that my father, who used to live in the holy city of Qom, one day went to the shrine of Sayyida Ma'asuma, salamullahi alayha, and listened to a lecture, a sermon by another scholar. And the scholar happened to pick up the book of Shaykh Abbas al-Qummi, Manazul al-Akhirah. And he said to his congregation, I'm going to explain and I'm going to go through this book for you. So the father of Sheikh Abbas, the author of the book Manazul al-Akhirah, comes home, looks at his son and says, Oh my dear son, I wish you were like that Sheikh. You would write a book like the book that was held up by that Sheikh. Now imagine, put yourself in the position of Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi. The first thing most of us will do is say what? My father, I am the author of that book, don't worry. Right? We would say that. Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi became quiet. He said to his father, oh my father, pray for me so that I will get that status one day. He would not even wish to say to his father, I am the author of the book. Lest there was an intention inside his heart that it was not for the sake of Allah. In case there was any shirk al ostentation that had crept inside his heart, he would remain quiet, he would remain silent. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, a wretched individual, a man who has darkened the history of Islam. One day he said to his entourage, bring me a group of people from the prison cells. I wish to slaughter them. This was Hajjaj. He would consume his food over the skull of the Alawiyyin, of the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They brought him a group of prisoners from the cells. He killed all of them until the final man, it was time for Salah. So he looked at the soldier and he says to him, hold on to this person, it's time for Salah, Allahu Akbar. It's time for Salah and he's slaughtering people. He goes away, so this man looks at the soldier and says to him, I ask you, in the name of Allah, let me go home and I have a number of debts that I have to fulfill. And as well, I wish to bid farewell to my family. And I make Allah the wakil. I make the Allah the kafil between you and I. Allah is witness that I will come back. This soldier said, are you serious? I can't let you go. Hajjad said, I have to look after you. He said, he pleaded. He said, please let me go. He said, finally, I let him go. I don't know what happened to me, but I let him go. Next morning, I was sweating. He hadn't turned up. And then I heard a knock on the door. He knocked. I said, you've returned. He said, why should I not return? And Allah was the kafil. I made Allah the witness that I will return. So I took him. I went to Hajjaj. Hajjaj says, where is he? I said, here he is. I gave him the story. Hajjaj thought for a moment. He said, okay. I leave him for you. You can do whatever you want with him. I took him outside. I said to him, you're free to go. At that moment, this is the gist. At that moment, this man who is now free to go looked up to the heavens and says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And he walked off. This soldier, this commander thought with himself, he is so ungrateful. He never said thanks to me. It's because of me that I freed him. Then I left him. I said to him, Junina wa Rabbul Kaaba. He's become crazy by the Lord of the Kaaba. Next day, I hear a knock on the door. It was that same man. He came to me. He said, Oh soldier, oh commander, I've come to say thank you to you. Why? I did not wish to say thank you yesterday because I cannot say thank you to you and to Allah at the same time. I cannot put you next to my creator. So I said thanks to Allah and the next day I've come to say thanks to you in case my intention becomes distorted. This is the importance that you and I have to take into consideration when it comes to ikhlas and sincerity. Number one. Number two. When the Imam alayhi salam was born, when Imam al Hussein was born, narrations tell us, authentic narrations tell us that he was presented before his grandfather Rasulullah. Rasulullah looked at him and said this very important statement, my dear brothers and sisters. He said, Allahumma khdul man khadalah. Oh Allah, disgrace whomsoever disgraces my grandson Hussein. What does this mean? One of the etiquettes of the adab of the majalis of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein is what? 
is that we have to ensure that we honor these blessed majalis by number one, presenting ourselves in the best possible way. Our dress code should be that which is indeed respectful to the majalis of Aba Abdullah. Number one. Number two, when we finish the majalis, we shouldn't allow the temptations of the shaitan to gossip, to chat, to backbite, to dissect the lives of others. We are still in the sanctity of the majalis of Hussein. Do not allow this to go away. Number three, we need to utilize these majalis for the instrumental change and the profound way in which we can go forward in our lives. In which way? We need to ensure that we take notes from what is being said. We need to, it is recommended to come to the majalis of Hussein in wudu, just like you're coming to the haram of Aba Abdullah. It is recommended that when you come to these majalis, you come with the intention that this Muharram will not be the same as the previous years. That I will make that oath of covenants between me and Hussein, that this Muharram will be different and I will change for the better. Tell me, is there anyone amongst us that doesn't have something that we wish to change? A negative attribute, something that we would like to see different in our lives? Let's make Muharram the station by which we make that important decision. The majalis of Aba Abdullah are that great opportunity. Our hearts open, they soften towards this great individual and what he stood for. Number three, there is so much emphasis, my dear brothers and sisters, on weeping and crying. Ayatullah al-Urma, Mar'ashi Najafi, Rudwanullah ta'ala alayhi. He said in his wasiyah to his son, when you bury me, bury my handkerchief with me. Why? Because this handkerchief I used to use to, to wipe the tears for Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Bury it next to me because he recognized the value of the tears that we shed for the musibah of Aba Abdullah. That the ahadith emphasize, man baka wa abka falahu al-jannah. That whomsoever cries and makes others cry, and even if you and I cannot cry, the traditions tell us that try to cry, attempt to cry. Seek this sadness and this grief in your heart. Tell me, if this was your relative, if this was a loved one, you would definitely cry. You would definitely mourn. How about the fact that it was the grandson of the Holy Prophet? That the Prophet of Islam would say that he is from me. That Rasulullah himself would cry over. That the Holy Prophet himself would shed tears. There is so much emphasis about the shedding of the tears. Why? It's not only these tears, these drops. It's what these tears would do. It's what the impact of these tears would be. The washing of our hearts. A new beginning. A new journey with the name Hussein that you and I can utilize. And finally, we begin this revolution from within by attending the majalis of Aba Abdullah. In which way we recognize that Imam al Hussein stood to fight falsehood. My dear brothers and sisters, within us, there is a Yazid, and within us, there is a Hussein. That there is a cry within us, driving us towards righteousness, driving us towards good deeds. Therefore, what do we do? That there is emphasis to serve in the majalis of Aba Abdullah. Do whatever you can. If it means financial assistance for the majalis, then you'll get, be greatly rewarded. If it means helping out by providing something for those who attend the majalis, then you'll be rewarded. In whatever capacity, those Khuddam al Hussein, those who serve the Majalis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them greatly on the Day of Judgment in this establishment of Sha'airullah. Thalik wa man yu'adhim Sha'airullah fa innaha min taqwal qulub. Indeed, on this particular day and in this night, as we have recalled the position of the Holy Prophet, there is one place to go, and that is Medina. Recalling the time that Aba Abdullah al Hussein would bid his farewell to his grandfather, Aba Abd, uh, Imam, uh, the, his grandfather, the Holy Prophet. What had happened? 15th of Rajab, 60 AH, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan dies, and his son Yazid becomes the Khalifa forcefully. He sends a message. 
to his governor in Medina, Al-Walid ibn Utbah, and says, take allegiance and oath and bay'ah from people. But importantly, three individuals. Hussein ibn Ali, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Al-Khattab. Make sure these three give you bay'ah. Imam al Hussein was in the masjid of the Holy Prophet, praying, supplicating. And at that time, the messenger from Walid ibn Utbah comes and says, the governor of Medina wishes to see you. Next to him was Abdullah ibn Zubair. Abdullah ibn Zubair is petrified. He says, I'm not sure why we're being called at this time. <coughs> it, was dark, it was late at night. Imam al Hussein says, I know why. Muawiyah has died. And Yazid has assumed this kingdom that they themselves have created. And they want bay'ah from us. Imam al Hussein goes to that meeting. He informs his loyal, faithful brother, Abu al Fadl al Abbas, that stand outside with 30 of Bani Hashim. And if you hear cries from within, then come inside and take me out. He goes to that meeting. He sits. Abu al Walid ibn Utbah looks at him. Next to him is Marwan ibn Hakam. He says to him, Now it's time to give bay'ah to Yazid. Yazid has become the caliph for the Muslims. Imam al Hussein says to him, It is not befitting for me to be in a small room in front of you. Why don't we go tomorrow in front of people and you can say whatever you wish to say? At that moment, Walid is thinking, Marwan ibn al Hakam, the arch enemy of the Ahl al Bayt, says, Wayhak. He says to Walid, Do not let him leave. Why? Because if you let him leave, he will never give bay'ah. Make sure he give bay'ah, otherwise kill him. Imam al Hussein looks at him and says, Yabna al-Zarqa, oh, the, the son of the blue-eyed women, Afabil mawti tukhawifuni? Are you making me, are you scaring me with death? And then he looks at the governor, says, Ya ayyuhal amir, oh governor, listen to this. This is the Imam alayhi salam outlining his message. He's saying, Yazid is a drunkard individual, is a fasiq, is a wretched man who kills innocent souls, who usurps property. Someone like me can never give allegiance to somebody like Yazid. At that moment, there's commotion inside. The Bani Hashim, Abu al-Fadl enters and Imam al Hussein leaves that meeting. Next morning, of course, he is visited or somehow he sees Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan says to him, if I was you, I give bay'ah to Yazid. Imam al Hussein says, Ala al-Islam salam Forget Islam if we are ruled by an individual called Yazid ibn Muawiyah. And indeed, Imam al Hussein set his mission absolutely crystal clear. The motive was to what? To uproot injustice and oppression and tyranny and to reform the Ummah of the Holy Prophet. And it was indeed the time to bid farewell. That night, he went next to the grave of his beloved grandfather, Rasulullah. He sits next to the grave, he weeps and cries. He says to his grandfather, Ya Rasulullah, this is what your ummah is planning to do. This is the state of the situation of the people. He falls asleep. He finds in his sleep a holy prophet. He looks at the prophet. He says, Jaddah, Ya Rasulullah, dhummani ilayk. Oh, my grandfather, Ya Rasulullah, take me towards you. The Prophet says to him, Bunay Hussein, Inna laka maqaman inda Allahi lan tanalahu illa bishahad. There is a status that Allah has reserved for you that you will not attain except with martyrdom. You need to go. You need to go to Karbala. Imam al Hussein says, I do not wish to go go back to this world I wish to remain with you Ya Rasul Allah Allahu Akbar it was time to bid farewell narrations tell us that Imam al Hussein also bid his farewell to the grave to the hidden grave of his beloved mother Fatima to Zahra to many people who were in Medina including the faithful wife of the Holy Prophet Umm Salama he comes to her she says to him do not miss Make me saddened. Do not make me grieve over your loss. Do not go, I plead 
with you. Imam al Hussein to her, says to her, Ya Ummah, this is the path that Allah has written for me. This is the path of martyrdom. Yet I will take my family with me. I will take my Ahl al Bayt with me. Why do you have to take your Ahl al Bayt? Sha'Allahu an yarahun sabaya. It is the will of Allah that they are seen as captives. Narrations tell us that before he left Medina, he had a daughter by the name of Fatima Al-Alila, a young daughter who was ill by the name of Fatima. He comes next to her. He bids her farewell. She looks at him. Can you imagine a small daughter bidding her farewell to her father? Oh, my father, take me with you. Do not leave me alone in this city. Imam al Hussein cannot take his daughter. She is too ill to take her with him. Yet she looks at him and says, If you cannot take me with you, then leave me, my brother Abdullah al Radhi. Don't take this young six month old child, Ali al Azgar. Leave this six month old child with me, Allahu Akbar. She does not know what is awaiting, what will happen to this young child of Hussein on the 10th of Muharram the messenger brings a letter from the daughter of Aba Abdullah the daughter of Aba Abdullah by the name of Fatima Al-Alila asks her father oh my father tell me what is the news what kind of news she is looking for what is the news of my uncle Abbas Imam Al Hussein looks on his right from far he could see the body of his brother Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas she says tell me the news of my brother Ali Al Akbar Imam Al Hussein looks at the tent there in there lies the body of Ali Al Akbar and Al Qasim Fatima says how is my brother the young six month old child Abdullah ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين The time of dua in the majalis of Aba Abdullah and in the majlis in which the name of Ahl al-Bayt is revived is a great time Utilize this time, ask for your hajat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer them, insha'Allah. نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها يا الله فرج عنا وعن أهلنا فرجا عاجلا قريبا يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم تب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم شافي مرضانا ومرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات بحق مريض كربلا زين العابدين وفقنا لمراضيك جنبنا معاصيك المؤسسون لهذا المجلس الشريف تقبل اللهم أعمالهم وإلى أرواح أمواتهم وإلى أرواح أموات الحاضرين رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة تسبقها صلوات